everybody, I think it's fair to say that there are plenty of cars out there which have a reputation that precedes them. Sometimes it's positive, sometimes it's negative, sometimes it's well earned, and sometimes it is certainly not deserved. And the car I am driving today I think falls squarely into the latter category. This is a 1992 Lotus Elan M100. You see, not only was this possibly the most thoroughly engineered and developed car Lotus ever made up until the present day, with a development cost of 35 million pounds, upon its launch it was also dubbed the greatest handling front wheel drive car of all time. A title that as far as many are concerned, it still retains. And yet somehow it is almost universally considered to be one of the firm's greatest failures. So today I'm asking the question was it really that bad and now 34 years after its launch does it deserve a second chance I think so and here's why story of the M100 is one so beset by complication and difficulty at every opportunity that you'd call it a miracle the car ever got to the showrooms at all. It actually began way back in the days of Colin Chapman who wanted to build a new Elan, a successor to the original of the 1960s and 70s, a new entry point for the Lotus brand to set alongside the likes of the Esprit and the Elite and Eclat. Initially dubbed the M90, it had all the ingredients you'd expect from a traditional roadster. A small, high-revving, naturally aspirated engine up the front, rumoured to be a 1.6-litre unit from Toyota. That, of course, would send drive to the rear wheels, and the chassis would be built in Lotus's typical fashion, with a steel backbone and a fiberglass body. Then, in the winter of 1982, Colin Chapman died, unexpectedly and tragically young. This put not just the future of the Elan in jeopardy, but that of the entire company, with many believing Lotus, without its founder, would simply cease to exist. Happily, thanks to the twin efforts of both Mike Kimberley and Toyota, Lotus's then technical partner and a firm with whom they've been developing a very close collaboration, they were able to keep the doors open. Mike flew over to Japan and secured a financial contribution from the Japanese that allowed them to keep things going. Unfortunately, thanks to some rather Machiavellian dealings behind the scenes, Mike's plan to get Toyota to take a controlling stake in the company unfortunately didn't come to fruition, with the firm instead being snapped up by BCA. And that, I think, is a great shame, because had Toyota been able to take a controlling stake in the firm, I think their history would have been a very different one. As the dust settled, plans for a new Elan continued, now dubbed the X100. Then, in the mid-1980s, as work was progressing nicely, Lotus had another change of owners, with General Motors now being the majority shareholders. Unfortunately, there was a meeting at which both the heads of General Motors and Toyota were present. At this stage, Toyota still had a share in Lotus, they still had a financial interest in the company, and the man from Toyota expected the man from General Motors to say that they just bought a part of the firm that Toyota also had an interest in. Unfortunately, this did not happen. The reason for this has been lost to history, and there is a good chance that it may have been a simple oversight, with no offence at all intended. Unfortunately, the Japanese perceived it as a great insult, and so, the next morning, Lotus found that all of their contracts with Toyota were cancelled. The firm was very upset at what had happened. After considerable begging and pleading, it was agreed that the parts they were already supplying would continue to be sold. However, they weren't going to be getting anything new out of Toyota, which put the brakes on the X100. However, with General Motors as a new parent, this unlocked a whole new set of parts bins, and so the car was thoroughly redesigned. This is the reason it has an Isuzu engine in it, because that was part of the GM empire, and in all fairness, it actually suits the car quite well. Unfortunately, in order to accommodate that engine, a more significant and controversial change was made, from rear to front wheel drive. Unfortunately, the difficulty didn't end there. With this car, one of the key aims was to be able to sell it to all markets, including, of course, the Americans. And Lotus had been promised that if the car were supplied with three-point safety belts as standard, airbags would not be a requirement. The USA then decided to make both 
seat belts and airbags mandatory, necessitating another redesign of the car. And then, at long last, the car finally made it to showrooms in 1989, where it was greeted by the Mazda MX-5, a shameless rip-off of the original Lotus Elan, complete with naturally aspirated, high-revving engine, rear-wheel drive and a lightweight body. To add insult to injury, it was about £5,000 cheaper than the base Elan. And so at that point, every history book will be keen to tell you the Elan did not stand a chance. In the three years it was on sale, they shifted just under 4,000 of them, compared to the more than 1 million MX-5s that have been sold to date. But is the M100 really that bad? And has history got it a little bit wrong? Well, let me put my foot down and I'll get back to you. things first, this car is an absolute riot. I love driving it. And whilst many people will be keen to tell you that it was a lot more expensive than the MX-5, and that is true, they'll often miss out the bit where they tell you it was also quite a bit faster. You see, for your £15,000, Mazda would give you an MX-5 with just under 120 horsepower and a 0-60 to time of just over 9 seconds. The regular, naturally aspirated 130 horsepower Elan was just over £19,000, but this this, the far more popular Elan SE, with its 165 horsepower turbocharged engine, cost you 21 and a bit thousand pounds and did 0 to 60 in six and a half seconds. Or, to put it another way, actually quicker than an Aston Martin V8, which would have cost about six times as much. In terms of interior, fit and finish, this car also feels at least the equal, if not maybe, the superior of the original MX-5. Sure, the indicators are off a of Vauxhall, but you have to remember, at the time, they were new Vauxhall indicator stalks. Lotus was still using them 30 years later. The dash is fairly simple, very classic orange on black, but easy to read and gives you everything you need to know. The car even comes complete with air conditioning and that 1980s must-have pop-up headlights. I will accept it's always been an odd-looking duck, the M100. The looks of it have always divided opinion. From some angles, it's absolutely sensational. Front-on in particular, it really does look like a proper sports car. Vibes of NSX and Esprit in equal measure. From the side, it's quite dramatic too, with that cut-off rear end. And though it does ride very high with this standard suspension setup, it's from the sort of three-quarter angles where it looks a little bit weird. And there'll often be times you look at it and go, yeah, no, that's not pretty. But overall, they certainly did put a lot of effort into it. To give you an idea of just how much effort we're talking about, this dashboard here was, I believe at the time, the largest piece of injection moulded plastic in the world, with the cost of that single part alone allegedly being more than that of the entire production line for the XL. Though it is certain the task of building the new Elan was taken very seriously, with the car undergoing a full testing and prototyping that you'd expect of a much larger manufacturer, there were still a few issues. Perhaps most famously, the car's odd looks are often attributed to a failure of communication. Lotus had developed a new and very accurate way of making their fiberglass panels. This was combined with a new type of resin that, unlike its predecessor, did not shrink when the parts came out of the mould. However, somebody neglected to tell all of the teams this, and so when the tooling was made, as per the artist's drawings, it was scaled up by 9% in order to account for the shrinkage, which no longer happened. But with the car essentially already in production, before the mistake was realised, the team simply had to work around what they had. Lotus being Lotus, they also put considerable effort into this car's suspension. So up front you have double wishbones in an arrangement that they called interactive wishbones. In other words, it's their way of trying to make the car handle, but without the corruption often associated with front-wheel drive. And it works.
165 horsepower and 148 pound-foot of torque, that's 200 newton meters, might also not sound like a lot, but neither is this car's curb weight of just over one ton. So it's definitely in the what you'd call brisk, not fast category. Trying to make an overtake can be a little bit tricky, but when you've got the road to yourself, there's ample power to put a smile on your face. The steering has a beautiful weighting, and though it lacks some of the delicacy and the interaction of other Lotus I've driven, possibly because of this suspension setup, it's still really, really good. Likewise, the clutch, throttle, and brake pedal, they're all beautifully interactive. Heel and toe in this car is a joy. Like most Delands out there, this one isn't entirely standard. It belongs to a lovely chap called Trevor, and the car is called Merlot on account of its shade, which I think is correctly called Silk Red. I actually filmed this car seven years ago when the channel was in its infancy, and Trevor was one of the very first people to trust me and let me drive their car, so I've always been eternally grateful to him, particularly as the video we made never actually went out. It was designed to be a part of a series which I wanted to make on the M100 that I never really got going, and by the time I got around to actually editing the thing, I wasn't really happy with the way that I'd shot it, I just didn't really think I'd done a good enough job. So we've spent the last sort of six or seven years meaning to get around to doing this again, and now at long last, I'm very happy to say I have finally done it. And I'm really, really glad about that because this is a fabulous car feels impossibly wide and low this thing considering it's not actually that big a car at all when you're in it it feels enormous the dash goes on for miles most old cars you sort of do that and you tap the windscreen but not this it does mean the car takes a little bit of getting used to because you're just not sure exactly how much of it is out there but once you spend a few minutes behind the wheel it begins to feel very natural indeed Alongside the uprated brakes, this car also has a Piper exhaust, which I have to say is perfectly judged, and I adore the little burble you get on the overrun. Something to note, these early cars do not have a catalytic converter, because at the time, it wasn't a legal requirement. Then, the only other change made to the car has been the fitment of a short shifter, which is actually pretty decent. The gear change is, is good. Though scuttle shake is certainly present, and you do notice it over rougher sections of road, it's nowhere near as bad as, say, a BMW Z3 or a Maserati Spider. That's like driving custard. As you might expect given the modest boost in power for the SE, the car has been designed so that it doesn't feel turbocharged, lag is minimal and the engine revs freely to its redline. It certainly feels like a good partner for the Elan's chassis. The chassis gives you huge confidence to press on and though you will eventually find the limits of grip, the car will communicate that to you nicely and clearly and it's still quick this thing. Autocar once called it point to point the quickest thing out there and though that certainly isn't true in the age of the Golf R, it's still a heck of a lot of fun. And it even scores relatively well in terms of some of the boring stuff. So you've got a reasonably spacious cabin here, certainly compared to an MX-5. The boot's actually a really good size as well, easily enough space for a couple of dedicated people to take it away camping. And it's a pretty comfy thing as well. The roof can be a little bit fiddly to get on and off. It is fully manual and you have to get out of the car. With a bit of practice, you can do it fairly briskly, but it'll never be anywhere near as slick as the Mazdas. Being a 30 plus year old sports car made by Lotus, it likely won't surprise you to hear that these do on occasion need a fair bit of money spent on them. I'd say budget at least sort of two to three thousand pounds a year, certainly for the first couple of years, to deal with any issues that you might have. Case in point, the brakes, the exhaust, the gear shifter, which was actually the only thing that ever let Trevor down. The original linkage failed and it did strand him. He also recently had the turbo refurbished and that was a four figure job but low four figures. Parts are generally available, including those for the Isuzu engine, which weirdly often come from Rock Auto over in the USA. Fuel economy can be up to about 35 to the gallon on a run, though it does require super unleaded on account of that now being the only E5 fuel that you'll get. Perhaps it is because of the company it kept that something dubbed the greatest handling front wheel drive car of all time could be considered a disappointment. But today, I think it really is time to reevaluate the Elam. 
History would tell you, like I've already mentioned, that it failed because it was too expensive and the MX-5 was a thing. Well, the fact is, plans were already afoot to make these considerably cheaper. Unfortunately, there was a little bit of internal politics going on, and though they were selling the cars at a high price, Lotus still weren't making that much money. And the reason for that? Well, let's just call it a little bit of corporate greed. The car was unceremoniously axed in 1992, and the workforce responsible for building it were fired. Then, a little while later, Lotus realised they were sitting on a stockpile of some 800 Isuzu engines for which they had no use. So, said workforce was quickly rehired, the car mildly re-engineered into what was called the Elan S2, and another short run made to keep things going while they developed the Elise which then landed in 1996, and at that point, the Elan was almost instantly forgotten. Today, of course, the Elise has gone on to become one of the most iconic sports cars of all time, and I think rightly so. It is in so very many ways a brilliant car. But if you want something a touch more usable, a touch more friendly, but still capable of putting a smile on your face, and you're not really fussed about rear or front-wheel drive, the M100 Elan, I think, absolutely deserves a second chance, particularly because for the price of the ropiest Elise around, you could pick up just about the best M100. Rest assured, it's a proper Lotus, this. And I think a really cool, quirky, and unusual sports car. That if you're into that sort of thing, is absolutely worth your time. And if you thought that was the end of the Elan story, there was one final and very weird chapter to it. After Lotus decided they were done with the car, a Korean company bought the rights to it so they could produce their own version, and thus the Kia Elan was born. It had a number of changes, including a different engine, but there were actually bold plans to sell it to UK buyers. Perhaps unsurprisingly, those plans never came to fruition, though they did build and sell the car in Korea, and today Kia UK have rescued one of the very few examples ever registered here and have preserved it for posterity. So I'm sorry Trevor that it's taken seven years to get this video done, but I'm really thankful to you for sticking with me, and of course I want to say a big thanks to both him and as ever to you for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button, comment down below and subscribe if you haven't already. I'll see you for the next one. Bye bye.